what are we looking at? It's a portrait of you, Malcolm. Well, I, I, can't, I can't actually see you without roller coasters. The roller coaster is surrounding you. Is it, um, is it like a prism? The scaffolding is part of you, it comes out of you. And, and I, was, I was thinking about it, wondering if it was like an exoskeleton, whether it is there to protect you and whether it actually helps hold you up. Um, and I think it does. I love rides. I love rides this much. If I could hug them, I would. I think I care about roller coasters very deeply, perhaps too deeply. My entire travel schedule, for the most part, is basically based on roller coasters. I love roller coasters about as much as I love pizza, and I love pizza. This is a wonderful ride. And to let it sit here and just decay is an obscenity. What's the longest you've lined up for a ride? Uh, probably the two hours for Sky Rush, which I didn't even get on. <laughs> Did you ever regret having uh, roller coasters tattooed over your body? No, I have a couple other ones that I kind of regret, but not the roller coaster. <laughs> I've traveled around the world speaking and researching for the past three years on a mission to find out why roller coasters, the signature attraction of a theme park, exist. I'm a roller coaster academic. Yes, that's right. Someone I was once friends with laughed when I told him, but he was just the type to say, I put the radio on as it makes the workday go faster, or is it the weekend yet? Counting down on social media the days till his holidays. He was, and we are, as a society, obsessed with our leisure time. It seems we endure work just so we can have it. And when something becomes an icon of leisure, we have to think about why, as a society, we made it that way. I started my journey searching for why roller coasters existed, but it ended up being a search for myself. Roller coasters exist because they let people do things you can't do anywhere else on Earth. Everyone is always looking for a thrill. They're looking for something different to experience. They're looking to be taken places they cannot go in their normal everyday life. Because they're so much fun. I mean, roller coasters, you know, it, it is the best way to really get that um, fight or flight response in such a safe way and also such a beautiful way. I think that the everyday world out there gets kind of hectic. So people come to parks and enjoy roller coasters and thrilling rides just as a form of escapism. A little bit of controlled chaos. Yeah, It's a safe way to induce fear in people. We have a natural need to have a little fear. And you're right, in today's day and age, we don't get that from just the natural environment. So we have to find a way to get it. I think people are looking for a thrill. I think they're looking for something out of the mundane in their life and something that's going to get their heart racing. People uh, want to be thrilled. They want to have that little bit of fear put in them, but knowing they're still going to come out of it okay. Some people like to be scared while they sit on their butt. They, they, want, they want the thrill brought to them, I suppose. Why do you think they choose to get that through getting on a roller coaster as opposed to climbing a mountain or, you know what I mean? Um, maybe because if they get hurt climbing a mountain, they can't sue somebody. <laughs> Probably the need for speed, and it's fun, and it, it just makes you feel good. I know that I'm safe. I'm pretty sure. I'm 99% sure that I'm safe. Why do we as humans need extra fear when there's more than enough scary things going on in the world? Why do coaster people like me seem to need it more than others? Is this a universal thing? I think yes, but I think watching um, I saw as many people standing off board coasters at parks in China, marveling at how huge they were and enjoying it f uh, at that level as I did see actually riding it. Some Asians, some Chinese people will think that spending your good hard earned money on a thrill ride that lasts for 30 seconds is probably not wise. They call it the king of the amusement park because every time a park puts in a roller coaster, their attendance goes up, their revenue goes up, and people want the highest, fastest, longest, whatever they want to say they did it. The roller coaster is, I guess, the end all and be all. That's the, the most thrilling, I think, in any amusement park. 
But the dream was always to have a coaster. The coaster was, you know, something you just had to have in an amusement park. And uh, a lot of planning and a lot of time. And um, when that coaster finally came to birth, it was a, a wonderful day, a really exciting day. Did you feel that you were giving a gift to the people that came to ride it? Oh, yes. Because I absolutely knew in my heart that a coaster would make, it would make the park grow into something more. A coaster is, is you know, it's a flagship. It's, it's a, a icon and it, it makes a park. I can tell you right now that we found the answer to why coasters existed very quickly. And yes, that's me we're looking at. We have a strong psychological need for them and they make a lot of money. The question then, of course, was why do people have this need? I've been nuts about roller coasters since I was a kid, an awkward, overweight kid, despite what my parents say, and different for a number of reasons. In school, I was too awkward to hang out with the boys and too disinterested to chase girls. Theme parks represented a safe place, a magical, hyper-real escape world for me. All I wanted as a kid was to find the group I belonged to, and I thought that group would have to be in a theme park. Somewhere along the way, I got old. Now, I'm turning 40. I think that's the official adult marker, right? When you're supposed to grow up and leave parks and rides to the kids. And I'm doing it by going to Disneyland. I just want to thank you for your research because we need to keep roller coasters in the forefront. We need to keep preservation. Uh, the American Coaster Enthusiast was founded on preservation. Speaking to Carol made me wonder, are we defined by our memories? Is that why we hang on to them so tightly? It's obvious that roller coasters mean a great deal more to people than just screams. The mere suggestion once of removing Disney's Matterhorn roller coaster was said to be an insult to the American psyche. We've got to fight for these you know, independent parks, we've got to fight for the experience, and we've got to build on, on a good business model of having fun. We have the first of the mobile exhibits from the National Roller Coaster Museum and Archive. Uh, it's been here for two seasons, and it was an opportunity for us to really share not only the timeline that there is, the history in linear form of the roller coaster itself, but also tangible archives and images and videos and things that we have of how the roller coaster and how theme parks themselves have integrated themselves into society. Uh, it's no different than a lot of treasures that we lose. The people don't think they're valuable, but when they're gone, we really mourn over them. And we really then, you know, 20, 30 years later, why did that disappear? So, you know, things do change, but hopefully they change for the better. And hopefully the things that have to go away can be preserved, at least through video, through, um, through memories, through photos, and actually through the actual artifacts. You know, whether it is a coaster car from the 1920s or whether it's something that was on a midway in the 1960s, families have memory of those things. I guess if I reflect on it, the memories I have of going to theme parks are special because I felt safe there. I was the odd one out at school, but that oddness seemed at home in a theme park. You'd have to wonder why, though. Interestingly, there is a lot of psychological research done on this. Because people just don't want to overthink it. It's like sex. The moment you start thinking about what you're doing, you're starting to engage this prefrontal cortex. The moment you do that, it's kind of all over. Oh, it seems to me it's a, a way for people to flirt with death without actually having to die. People have this obviously in varying degrees, but everyone has a little bit of it. Right? You're slightly fascinated by traffic accidents and uh, lots of people, when they stand on very tall places, cliffs or buildings, they, they look down and they just imagine without actually wanting to do it. You know, what would it be like to take one more step? And roller coasters obviously are a way of doing that without personal injury. I think roller coasters give people an escape that is just this side of dangerous, right? It's, uh, it's um, not dying. <laughs> um, fear minus death equals thrills. Do you think it's strange that your 40-year-old son has chosen to spend his birthday at Disneyland? No. Yes. No. Well, not you. Because I'm always strange. Well, no, you've just you've just always been obsessed with roller coasters since you're really, really young. So it's just half of the course. Yes. You're obsessed. <laughs> no, I don't you're think obsessed. It's, I don't think it's strange. I think it's lovely that you've followed through your life with the love of it and you've never lost the love of it. Now I was a fat kid and I was an awkward kid and you seem to not believe that. No, you weren't a fat kid.
No, no, not fat. No, not fat. Awkward. Um, yes. Parents will never say to their kids, oh, you're actually really fat and awkward. I think well, we've got, I think we've even got uh, some of your drawings of roller coasters and everybody on the roller coaster is going. <laughs> when other six and seven year old boys are riding bikes and playing with cars and you are talking and drawing and wanting to go and back then there wasn't many theme parks there was probably two theme parks and so for you to go and see roller coasters it was it was really hard for you to feed your obsession that wasn't all i did i also manufactured air coasters and stuck paddle pop stick people into them your story mirrors mine because as a very young child i literally used to string paper tracks around my whole entire room because i remember the Christmas I got the Kinex roller coaster set, and I sat there for hours on end with my fingers pretty much bleeding. It meant that I could take my ideas and actually realize them. When you're a creative person, you just create because that's who you are. Various people choose different mediums to do that with. Some paint, some sing, some perform music, uh, they may act on stage, others, design massive steel creations that thrill people. So slides are for little kids, roller coasters are for big little kids. Do you think though that at some point in life people should just grow up and, uh, and abandon these rides? No. no. Age is no. only a number. You can be old at 40 and you can be young at 70. So it's just yeah. a number and, it, and it's, it's how you feel is the main thing, not, not your age. Dad's right of course, but people call me childish for liking coasters in theme parks. Maybe I do need to grow up and see society for what it really is. Maybe we have no greater purpose any more than to consume, and theme parks and thrill rides are just dressing that consumption up to make us feel like we're somehow doing more than we actually are. And why are we paying for more fear when we're apparently living in the era of terror? And what do people call out for God on rides, even when they're not religious? I'm aware on the surface this seems like a very Western privileged question to even be pondering, but the world has changed enormously since the Industrial Revolution, and we haven't. We used to be running from saber-toothed tigers and now everything is just presented to us and we're patted on the back for modest achievements like, dare I say it, riding a roller coaster. We are presented with things that distract us from um, reality and distract us from the ordinariness and the, the routine um, of our lives. Uh, and they are they're designed to seem exciting. In fact, they are exciting. But in, in, in essence, in some ways, they are trivial but they're fun at the time and they take us away from that sense of the everyday and the humdrum. Bakhtin's idea of the carnivalesque is based on this thinking that all societies provide room for things to go crazy every now and then, where everything gets reversed and everything gets thrown up in the air and everybody drinks too much and dances and eats too much and has a fantastic time, but you know there is a limit. You know at the end of the carnival, everything will go back to normal. And I think roller coasters can be usefully compared. You know, it's a good way to think about them because some roller coasters do literally turn you upside down in your life, don't they? But at the end, you come back to normality. You're, you're brought back to where you are. There has to be some kind of challenge in getting on something that is unexpected, right? You, you don't know what to expect because you haven't been on it before. And all you know is what you've been told, either by people who've ridden it who are going to brag about how intense it was, or in marketing literature, which is going to brag double over about how intense it is, right? So there's something very real and psychological to being afraid of a thing you've never experienced before. The challenges we face today just are, are not quite as, as risky. And they're not as immediate. I think that that's a, actually really important too, that the challenges that we have today are so long-term. It's, you know, if we're trying to um, build a successful life or have a happy life, they're, they're very much, you know, how can we, you know, maintain our, our health and beauty for as long as we can? How can we create some sort of financial stability to take us into retirement? How can we, you know, build a sustainable um, lifestyle right now? And they're all very future oriented, but for a majority of human history, it's all been very present oriented, you know, just how can I make it through this day? These days, we are very much, I think, expecting that the next thing is provided to us and that we're, you know, the most we can do is earn enough to own it. But we are, we are no longer primarily responsible for manufacturing a lot of the things that make our lives meaningful. People are, are maybe bored in their normal existence. So they're looking for something to give them that thrill. Roller coasters, people feel like after they've ridden one, hey, I, I survived it, I did it, and all of these other people didn't. So that elevates me to a different level. 
Uh, I think that some people uh, ride them, they weren't really ready or prepared to ride them, but because their peers did. <laughs> and so you, and they're, they're happy usually after they've done it. But that's why you see the I survived name of ride shirts. Uh, because now not only did you ride it, you need to go out and brag about it. We have people that have been here and have ridden Millennium Force uh, going on 1,000, 1,500 times in a row. Uh, it's just a personal accomplishment. You know, it's no different probably than finishing uh, you know, uh, college, finishing an exam, going on to something different, graduating from school, um, you know, earning a degree, getting promoted at work. It's an accomplishment. And that's, I think that's that, it's probably that sense of pride that you're able to conquer something. I can't help thinking riding coasters is some sort of initiation ceremony, like the guys in Papua New Guinea who jump off the towers, a way to become an adult. I was never good at sports as a kid, but I felt I could prove my braveness by riding big coasters. I may have been kidding myself. Roller coasters really aren't exclusive, right? Your grandmother can, you know, put her walker down and stagger onto a roller coaster and, you know, ride it perfectly safely and, and come off thrilled and you know, more power to her. But it, you know, it's not the case that you need to be godlike or heroic. Everyone's looking for that adrenaline, but not everybody can be that marathon runner or that mountain climber or even like bungee jumper. Cause that, it, so the average individual, that's you and me, we can go on these these roller coasters and these thrill rides and get that same thrill and that same fear before you go on and accomplishment when you get off. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> oh, 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 the voyage. All right. Uh, we just rode the voyage together. Uh, it was uh, bone shattering and awesome at the same time. I think it's incredibly special. I think there are a few things you can do that bring people closer together than sharing a coaster. I felt welcomed at every park I have ever gone to, whether they've been uh, premier parks are absolute trashy asphalt holes. I feel like physical spaces my parks might understand me better than many of the people I know. Like the stuff they're made of is the stuff I'm made of. You don't have to stop doing it. Say again? You don't have to stop doing I, I think I have to, I, unless I'm going to start crying. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's not normal, I, and I know it's not typical or, or common, and I think to an extent, I'm probably still that smallish child who feels like he needs to be doing more of what is common or expected and not feeling things as acutely. And I, that is part of my adulthood. But I, I am so enthralled by things like amusement parks. It's hard to hide. One of the things I like so much about Dana, Envy, I guess, is that he's a professor, a success by any definition of the word. But even though he's operating in a grown-up world, the whole time I've known him, he's never wavered in this unquestioning belief that parks are pure, untouchable magic and no one can convince him otherwise. He found his identity and he's never changed. Even if he does sound a bit mad sometimes. When I was young, living in a small country town, I entered a colouring in competition to redesign my home park's mascot's car. And I used the front carriage of their roller coaster and uh, put hot rodded it up, put flames on it, and I won. You don't remember it? I do. I don't remember you entering a competition. But for whatever reason, we didn't go. I had the golden ticket in my hands and we didn't go. Why didn't we go? I, I can't remember whether we were, we were going somewhere or we had something planned or we weren't going to be in that area at that time. Um, I, I can't maybe remember. Maybe we but were I... sick. Maybe your dad was working. Maybe we didn't have enough money to travel. Maybe you weren't being a good boy. Yeah, that could be it. On my ninth birthday, after a lot of whining and guilt trips, we finally got to go. <laughs> we remember pulling into the car park at Dreamworld and, uh, and, and uh, we said, oh, well, while we're going past, you, we can just sit here and you can watch the roller coaster. And then they gave you your card. And you and opened card, it up. it said... Happy birthday. Your birthday is a full day at Dreamworld. <laughs> and you were out of that car and over at that gate before we got out of the car, I think. <laughs> and then we had to spend the rest of the day following you and watching you watch the roller coasters go round and round and round all day. So finally, a cruelly delayed childhood dream was realised and it went to my magic place and it was everything that I'd hoped for, which made me all the more surprised when the park did what they did to me as an adult. Meet my partner, Pete. 
He's a fifth day in black belt and has his own martial arts school with nearly 200 students. That means he's technically a badass, but he sure is excited about going to Disneyland. I'm jealous. Can't find a sock. I've overthought parks and rides to hell and back. I'm packing for our trip to Disneyland. And I wish I could experience it all again through his eyes, like my first time. What, uh, what, is, what does Disney mean to you? Um, Disney's, I suppose it represents a, um, going back to my youth, I remember watching the Mickey Mouse Club as a kid and it was the happiest place on earth. Well, I think going to a theme park is one of the few acceptable ways for an adult male to feel like a kid again. I think a lot about innocence and what role innocence has in the life of a happy adult and how somehow we trick ourselves into believing that to be an adult you have to leave behind all these things from childhood that you can never regain. I happen to think quite differently. I, I think that part of being a happy adult is figuring out that there are certain things about childhood like certain kinds of innocence that you have to fight for and passionately maintain and everything about happy adulthood depends on that. And I think that there is something about uh, theme parks and amusement parks and places like this where we, I don't know, where we reenact things that have made us happy in the past and they remind us of how we can, how we can still be what we once were and not have to give up everything entirely. So I spoke to the park about this very project and initially they were very excited. I just wanted to film a couple of interviews in front of a few rides. But there must have been a management change or something, and then all of a sudden they wanted $4,000 to film anything. And I wondered if I was asking too much. I tried to, you know, see if we could uh, do it in a smaller way, but no, it was $4,000 or you're out. So all the magic and all the good times that uh, I'd had at that park, everything I had invested in it, clearly did not count. Now I get it, they're a business. It's not up to them to track my childhood memories. But it was a very sobering, jarring reminder that they are a business and you really can't invest anything more in them than that. So that's adulthood, I guess. The facade gets stripped away, you look back in the dark ride and you can see the props resetting for the next group. It wasn't just for you. I'm not saying all coaster people are like me, but when I hear people say they base their entire lives around riding roller coasters, my first thought is, what exactly is wrong with you? And yet, I've just spent the last three years of my life researching these things, so maybe these are my people. I'm off to CoasterCon, the annual gathering of the American coaster enthusiasts, to meet with some more nuts like me. Some people go their entire lives, never finding their thing. Their life is just a bit beige. We did, or we think we did. You know, there's a certain uh, childlike quality of uh, amusement parks and roller coasters that people enjoy and want to keep doing uh, throughout their life, even though it's you know, it is a kid's uh, thing initially, but uh, I think everybody enjoys an amusement park, so. This very week, my daughter was getting married, and she was getting married within an hour of a theme park that was going to be hosting a convention, so she actually planned her wedding to coincide with the roller coaster event that I was going to. We become very close, and we really are a nice, close-knit family. You got engaged <laughs> on a roller coaster. Yeah, I actually tied a piece of string on the ring and then tied it to oh, my you don't finger. Want the thing to fall off. So I didn't want it to fall off. It would be the most expensive loose article ever. <laughs> I couldn't imagine a world without roller coasters. It's just such a huge part of my life. I don't know what would replace that weight. For a minimum of $3 donation, you got a dozen cookies and everything goes to the preservation fund. Why would you do this? There's a lot of parks that run in the tough times and they can't afford some of the things they do and with Ace giving money back to doing things like Leap the Dips and Kanye out and getting stuff, if I could add a little bit of money to, to that fund then, then I feel like when I go to that park I felt like I contributed to it. Try harder. Be more fabulous. More fabulous. You think I need to be more fabulous in my more coaster fabulous. picture? Like, what are you talking about? What we felt last night? Well, we were just in the moment. You know, we were riding together, and we were just we're going fast. We're flying out of our seat. We're hitting the hitting the ground again. So one of the things a roller coaster will do is focus your attention for you. You don't have to do all the six years of yoga practice. When you're dropping down, you're not thinking about folding the laundry. You're just thinking, maybe, I will die. And, and that's why you might have this feeling of, you know, I was never so alive. 
because all of you is there, whereas normally, obviously, you're completely alive and you're folding your laundry. But when you're folding your laundry, you're thinking about so many things. You're like, wow, you know, sharing the, sharing the, the, the feeling and sharing the moment. So many people in this project making great emotional commitments. I really hope they continue to get what they need from these rides and parks. Sometimes it sounds like what you're saying is, um, it's, it's kind of cute that when you're young, you look at these things with these young eyes and it feels like the whole park is there to serve you, but that it's proper when you're old to not think of it that way. And I, I really want to ask, why is that? Why is the adult way better? The adult way isn't necessarily better, but, it's, but when you get older, it's as if you need to sort of parcel away that part of you, that the kids are allowed to have that, but you're not allowed to have it anymore. So that's why all these people are having kids, because they want to be able to relive their childhood without having to ask special permission to go alone. Why did we ride X2 together? Ah. We had spent all day together riding coasters, so there was this social activity we were doing together, and that was like the last one of the night. And that's like the closing act of a play. That's like the last chapter of a novel. Our day was at a Six Flags park. It wasn't necessarily about story. It was about big pieces of iron. But the story we have to tell about that place is just as important. Every Sunday, the family, when Wonderful World of Disney would come on, um, my mother would make a big batch of popcorn. So that was just always a huge goal to go there. When I finally got to go to Disney World for the first time, I was probably 15 years old, and still walking through the gates, coming around and seeing the castle for the first time at the end of the street. I couldn't show it on the outside, but inside I was dancing. I think there is something about people wanting to recapture this innocence of youth, the things that meant directly pleasurable uh, experiences to them when they were young. And, and people do go through this stage of, of being cynical and doubtful and everything is commercial and there's no such thing as altruism and everyone is selfish. And, and I think you can come out the other side in this three-stage process. You start innocent and trusting and, and you just love ice cream just because you love ice cream. And, and then later you think like, oh, ice cream companies, they're putting chemicals in there just to, to manipulate my brain. And, and then later I think it is possible to come out on the other side and, and, and just enjoy ice cream again. This is sort of the corporatization of the world, you just feel so alienated and you just kind of need that moment of release. But it's, that's, I always find that the answer is sort of defeatist, almost. It, it's, I mean, it's sort of like you're, you're acknowledging, yeah, it's all pointless and you just need to have this moment where you feel alive for no real reason to be able to face down the horridness of ordinary existence. And I, I always kind of want, I, I wanted to find there's something more in that. It's not just a means of escapism. It's, there's, I, I wanted to find some sort of inherent meaning within the experience itself. And uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I lost my mother. Um, it was very difficult. It was a whole drawn out process, but this was in December of 2013. Um, and we had already had a plan to go, my husband and I, um, the following February. So um, we decided not to cancel. But when we got to Disney, something inside me just really started to fall apart. And it was, I didn't know what it was. And watching the fireworks, um, I really broke down. And I realized that you know, I had said goodbye to my mother as an adult, but there was a little boy inside that lost his mommy. And um, that just came out. Uh, do I feel manipulated by Disney when that happened? Not at all. That's something that they've established. Um, and it was really a beautiful thing. And it was a catharsis that I really needed, obviously. The kind of deeply meaningful experiences you have places are never just the place. It's not like you go see the Grand Canyon and the Grand Canyon made you have a transcendent experience any more than riding a really big coaster made you have a transcendent experience. You were you. You brought you to the park. You brought you to the ingredients that they add to the equation. And together something special happens. So ultimately, I found the ability to accept myself 
accept getting older, get comfortable with my identity and my journey. I guess I got to know myself and I'm okay. As we get older, some of our dreams get smaller and we start to see life as it really is. These parks are a business, I understand that. But they work with us. And even if it's just a small, seemingly insignificant thrill and the magic is manufactured, we can for just a moment be truly free to forget, to fly, to laugh, to scream, to have a shared experience, and just for a short moment in time, to be fully present, fully alive. And there's nothing wrong with that.